Hi, this is Sue Jackson of the Book by Book blog, and I'm here today with my January reading wrap-up. Um, now, I am way behind on my blog. Um, I've only reviewed one book that I read in January so far. Um, as you may know from my other videos, I got COVID at the beginning of January. So that's kind of, I had about three weeks or more of feeling really sick. So that set me way behind. Um, but I figured there's no reason that my videos need to be late too. I can go ahead and uh, do the video and the reviews will be coming. January was a good reading month for me. It was a great start to the new year. That was like the only good thing about January. Um, I finished six books in January, two on audio and four in print, and I enjoyed all of them. So first off, I started off the year with a book for one of my book groups, Janesville, an American story by Amy Goldstein. Um, this is a nonfiction book, and I have to admit, I didn't really want to read it. And during our book group meeting, most of the other members said the same thing. I don't know why this book got chosen, um, because most people said they weren't that excited about reading it. But all of us agreed we were glad we had read it and that, you know, it turned out to be a really good book. So it's, it's the true story of the town of Janesville, Wisconsin, that had this huge GM plant at the center of not just its economy, but also its community for on, almost 100 years. And then in 2008, during the economic downturn, that plant shut down. Now that left, the effects were really far reaching. It left not only thousands of people out of work from the plant, but there were all kinds of other smaller businesses in town that supplied goods and services to the plant, not just the automotive parts, but like um, lunches for the workers and supplies to the plant and all kinds of things. So it really created a huge economic and community um, tragedy for this town. So the book begins with the plant closing. You get a little bit of history and then it goes into what happened next. Um, and what made it interesting and immersive and not dry like some of us had worried is that the author focuses in on individual people that were affected in different ways by the plant's closing. So some of them were GM employees that got let go. Um, some of them were the spouses and children of GM employees whose lives were also changed dramatically. Um, some of the people highlighted in here were trying to help the unemployed um, plant workers people who worked at the community college, um, with a local group that tries to get um, grants, federal grants and loans for, for the community, all different kinds of components to this community that were all you know greatly affected by this plant's closing. Like I said, we were, most of us were worried it was gonna be kind of boring and it was not. It's, it's a really immersive, um, interesting story and, and fascinating. And it really gave me a better idea of, you know, how things in a community are interconnected. And, you know, by the end of the book, five years later, the community and many of the people had not fully rebounded from the loss of that plant. So, it, you know, it's very sobering, but uh, fascinating. Uh, that's Janesville, an American story by Amy Goldstein. Next up, I listened to a wonderful audiobook that I know is going to end up in my top 10 for the year, even though it's only January. Um, I listened to The Sentence by Louise Erdrich. Um, she is one of my favorite authors, and I love listening to her novels on audio because she reads them herself. 
and her intonations and her accent are just perfect. And of course, as the author, she knows just what to emphasize and where the jokes are. And oh, as with all Louise Erdrich books, I just loved it. But this one, I don't know, this one felt really special to me. It's about a Native American woman named Tookie uh, up in Minnesota, who at the very beginning of the book, when she's young, she gets sent to prison. And the rest of the book is about what happens when she gets out. So you get a little bit of the inter in the introduction of how she ended up in prison, which is actually a pretty funny story. And then the rest of the book is her life after prison, trying to rebuild her life. She's actually a very good person. Um, things just went wrong to, to land her in there in the first place. So Tookie gets a job at a bookstore in Minneapolis, um, the Birch Bark Bookstore, which is the real life bookstore owned by the author. So Louise herself is actually a character in this novel. Um, not a main character, but she runs the bookstore that Tookie works at. So it's about Tookie and her husband and the other people that work in the bookstore. Um, in the first half of it, one of their, um, one of their regular customers dies and her ghost begins haunting the bookstore. But only Tookie is aware of the ghost at first. So that's a lot of fun and, and interesting. Um, as always, Louise dives deep into, you know, it's a very immersive novel in terms of Native American culture, traditions, things like that. Um, in the second part of the book, and this sort of snuck up on me, I didn't realize when it was set, but about halfway through the book, it's March 2020. Yeah, we all know what happens next. So it was really fascinating to read about, you know, these people, ordinary people working in a bookstore, not knowing what's coming and how bad it's gonna be and how long it's going to last. And one of the characters does get COVID. Um, so, and it is 2020 and they are in Minneapolis. So George Floyd happens. So there's a lot about that as well, um, how the community's feeling, how it affects everyone. There are just so many different facets to this book. It's intricate, um, it's very intimate. You really get to know Tookie and her husband and, and some, of, some of her coworkers. Um, I just loved every moment of this. And Louise is narrating it, so it was wonderful to listen to. So I highly recommend The Sentence by Louise Erdrich. Now, I was listening to that during some of the worst parts of my illness, um, and it was a wonderful, like, comfort read. And so was the book that I was reading in print. Happiness um, by Amanata Forna. This is a novel... Um, I think my husband gave this to me for my birthday last year, last summer. Um, but as you can see from the cover, it was perfect for winter reading. It is about two different people whose lives intersect unexpectedly. And I really like that kind of story. So we've got Jean, who's an American. Um, she's a wildlife biologist and she is living in London studying foxes. You can see the little fox on the cover there. So she's studying urban foxes, which I don't know if you've seen this in the news, but this is in real life, a big issue in London. So Jean is there as a wildlife biologist studying the, the characteristics of the fox, the urban foxes in her area. Um, and she's got this whole like um, cadre of regular people, um, security guards and um, cab drivers, different people around town who are also kind of keeping an eye out and reporting back to her. Um, Jean is living a pretty lonely life because she's divorced and her husband and son 
are back in the United States, I think in Massachusetts. The other main character in Happiness is a man named Attila. Um, yes, just like that, Attila. <laughs> he is from Ghana. He's a psychiatrist and he is world renowned for his studies and his work in PTSD. So his job very often involves him going to horrible war-torn places where, you know, horrific things are happening and working with people there, um, often soldiers, but sometimes civilians as well. So Attila is staying in London because he's going to give a talk um, at a big conference. He's actually the keynote speaker on PTSD. So, um, so Attila is there and right at the very beginning, he and Jean literally bump into each other on the Waterloo Bridge in London. Um, so that's how they meet and then their paths keep crossing. Now Attila also, he knows some people in the city um, this kind of comes out later in the book. He's there specifically to visit one person. Um, but also a woman who is kind of like uh, a niece to him. I think he's the god, her godfather. Um, her son goes missing. They are also from Ghana and her son goes missing. And so by this time, Attila and Jean know each other. Attila gets a group together to try to search for the missing boy and Jean joins in. So, you know, their lives slowly get closer together and intersect. Um, it was just a very, there are some difficult topics in here. Obviously we're dealing with PTSD, we're dealing with war. Um, you know, some of the experiences Attila has been through have been very difficult. Jean's going through a difficult time. So there are some sort of issues and difficult topics here, but overall it is a warm, comforting story of, you know, two lonely people whose lives intersect. And I really enjoyed it. Um, so that's Happiness by Aminata For Forna. Next up in January was another nonfiction book and another one I didn't want to read. It was also for book group, for my other book group. My neighborhood book group was discussing Bottle of Lies by Catherine Iban. Um, this is about, well, the, uh, the subtitle is The Inside Story of the Generic Drug Boom. So it is about the generic drug industry and the FDA. Um, forget Stephen King. This is a real horror story, <laughs> which is part of why I really didn't want to read it. Um, I do have a chronic illness. I rely on, I don't know, maybe 15 different uh, prescription medications that are all generics. And, you know, I just saw what the book was about. And I was like, I really don't want to know. But I am glad I read it. I'm glad that I know, although it's terrifying. Um, Catherine is an investigative reporter and she digs into this issue of um, once Congress allowed generic drugs to be made, which is a good thing because it makes a lot of prescriptions more affordable for regular people, um, but when that happened, countries all over the world began making generic drugs. And I truly thought that generics were 100% equivalent to the brand name drugs. They're really not. Um, so she goes through, the first half of the book is really about one company in particular. So that made me feel better because I went and checked all my bottles. And <laughs> none of them were made by this company because it's no longer in business. Um, but she, it, that's really just the first half of the book because they're kind of an example of what's happening all over the world. So it's um, an Indian drug company that... Um, 
I don't know a nice way to put this. They are crooked from the top down. The entire business is fraudulent. Um, they are making the drugs and buying the active ingredients from another supplier who's also unreliable. Um, but when the FDA comes to visit, and this is one of the issues the book covers, with so many companies all over the world making generic drugs now, the FDA can't possibly police them the way it does companies in the U.S. Um, so when the FDA does come to call, this company just makes everything up. They are showing fake data to the FDA um, auditors. Um, now, I used to do some similar kind of work, not in the pharmaceutical industry, but I worked in quality management systems. I audited quality management systems. So I understood like a lot of the perspective of the FDA investigators. Um, and I was just stunned like that some of these companies are so fraudulent. I'm an optimist. I believe in the best in people. I did not think this was possible. So anyway, um, oh, and I forgot to mention, the writing is excellent. Um, it's a very, like I said, I wasn't excited about reading it, but it's gripping and it really grabbed me right from the beginning. Parts of it read almost like a legal thriller. Um, so, you know, the writing is excellent. It's very engrossing. Didn't have any trouble finishing the book, even though it's a pretty hefty one. Um, the information is terrifying, but uh, I am glad that I read it and um, I did enjoy reading it. I, well, enjoys it. <laughs> I didn't have any trouble finishing it. I don't know how much I enjoyed learning these horrible things. Um, I Unfortunately, I missed our our meeting, even though it was on Zoom, I was still really sick and wasn't up to it um, because I really wanted to talk this over with, with my other book group members. Um, but that's Bottle of Lies by Catherine Avon. It is an excellent book group book because there is so much to talk about here. My second audiobook for January was Mercy Street by Jennifer Haig. Um, as I've mentioned here before, she is one of my favorite authors, and she hasn't had a new, new book in several years. So I was thrilled to see uh, that this was coming out. It was just released on February 1st. Um, like I said, it's been a few years since she released a new one, so I was really excited. And it was excellent, just like all of her novels. What she uh, and I've been trying to put my finger on why I like her books so much. She just really makes characters come to life on the page. Ordinary people living ordinary lives. So in this book, um, Mercy Street is the name or really a nickname for a women's clinic in Boston that's located on Mercy Street. Um, and the book follows several different characters who's, who live completely separate lives, but whose lives intersect at some point during the story. So uh, Claudia is pretty much the main character. Um, she works at the clinic. She is a therapist that that helps counsel patients. Um, it, it is a broad women's clinic. They offer a lot of services, but of course some people focus only on the abortion services that they offer. Um, but they do, they are many women's only source of health care. So Claudia works as a, a counselor at the clinic. Um, the book goes back in flashbacks and tells you about Claudia's childhood. Um, she grew up very poor in rural Maine, just her mother and her um, in a small trailer. And then her mom began taking in foster children. So um, Claudia ended up pretty much being the mother to all these foster kids that came through their lives over the decades. Um, she was the oldest. Her mom was working two jobs and just wasn't around much. She took in the fosters for money. And um, so Claudia ended up caring for the kids most of the time. Um, so as you can imagine, she's not real eager to have children herself. At this point in her life, she's in her 40s. 
So that's Claudia. Um, Anthony is a man, I think like in his 30s or 40s, he lives nearby. He grew up in the area. He was hurt in a construction accident, had a, a severe head injury, and is still suffering some of the effects of that. Um, so Anthony's living with his mother, he's living on disability. Um, his only real focus in life is the Catholic church, um, his neighborhood Catholic church that he grew up going to. He goes to mass every day, uh, him and a bunch of elderly people. Um, he's really, you know, committed to the church. And so he gets involved in their anti-abortion activism. So Anthony sometimes takes the ferry, he's on a, a, an island, I think, takes a ferry to the clinic, the Mercy Street Clinic and protests there, joins the, the protesters. Um, Anthony also has a website called The Hall of Shame. Um, and he started that, it's got photos of women going into the clinic. And again, not all of the women are actually there for abortion. In, in fact, probably the majority are not. But um, Anthony takes photos of these women and puts them up on the website. Now he was enticed to do this by a man named Victor, who's not even in the area. He lives in rural Maryland, but Victor is an extremist. He is a survivalist. He's got a huge cache of weapons. Um, he's a, a misogynist, a horrible racist. His reason for protesting abortion is because he's decided that all of America's problems stem from the fact that people, that women of color reproduce at a higher rate than white women. So while Anthony's taking pictures of all the women that go into the clinic, Victor only wants the ones on the website of women of color. So that's kind of what's going on there. So right off the bat, you know that Victor could be dangerous. Um, Anthony, you know, he's just doing what he believes in and um, kind of following along. There's one other character in the book, a main character, and that is the the guy who's in his 30s, I think, and is the weed dealer for both Anthony and Claudia. Um, he went to school with Anthony, so he knows him from childhood. Uh, Claudia visits him once a week. Um, and Anthony and Claudia's paths intersect there. So, you know, it's interesting because for much of the book, you're getting the stories of each of these people separately. Um, chapters rotate between the different characters. But, you know, at certain points, their lives intersect. And um, so it's an interesting book and things happen and there is some suspense and some action, but, you know, it's mostly an in-depth character study of these people. And, you know, you're seeing all these people from very different perspectives. So that makes it pretty fascinating. Although I did not really enjoy listening to Victor's parts. <laughs> Just, you know, listening to that kind of rhetoric. Um, but I really enjoyed the whole book. Um, and I still love Jennifer Haig. Um, I, I have missed a couple of the novels on her backlist. So I'll have to go back and catch those. That's Mercy Street by Jennifer Haig. For my last book in January, I decided to get a head start on my Classics Challenge. Every year I sign up for a Classics Challenge. Um, I'll, I'll include a link down below to my book blog where I've got all my reading challenges laid out. Um, I didn't do well on my Classics Challenge last year. I aimed to read six classics and I only read four. So I thought I'd get a head start jump right into January. Um, I picked up The Illustrated Man by Ray Bradbury from my shelves. Another reading challenge I do every year is the TBR challenge to read from your own shelves. And that's another one I need to do more of. So I am a Ray Bradbury fan from way back. Um, I think this is another book my husband gave me for my birthday last year. When I was a teenager, I discovered Ray Bradbury in my public library and read every single Bradbury book they had 
<laughs> on the shelves. Um, I did the same thing with Agatha Christie around that same time. Um, so I loved Ray Bradbury back then. In the last couple of years, I have just started kind of rediscovering him. Um, I don't remember an awful lot, even though I read all of his books. It was a very long time ago. <laughs> so I've been enjoying rediscovering them. The Illustrated Man is actually a collection of short stories that are loosely linked. So the man of the title um, really just comes up in the introduction of the book. He is a man whose whole body is tattooed. And this other man meets him on the road. Um, they're both traveling. This is in uh, rural Wisconsin in the summer. They're both traveling and they decide um, to camp together one night. And the illustrated man takes his shirt off and the other guy can see all the tattoos. And he explains, the illustrated man explains that at night when the sun goes down, his tattoos come to life and each tattoo moves and tells a story like a little tiny movie on his skin. So the rest of the book is the other guy lying awake all night watching this guy's tattoos tell stories. Um, the stories, as always with Bradbury, are all so different and all so brilliant. What I love about Ray Bradbury is he's, he's so clever and his stories are very often so thought provoking. Um, what I found fascinating is he wrote most of these stories in the 40s and 50s. I think this collection was published in 1951. And, you know, science fiction from back then, and most of these are science fiction. Science fiction from back then sometimes seems a little silly now, right? I mean, you know, well, there are some moments like that in this book, like, you know, it's the future and instant mail is like pneumatic tubes in your house that deliver the mail. <laughs> and it's like, you know, science fiction writers back then didn't even conceive of the possibility that we have now, you know, whole supercomputers that we hold in the palm of our hand and carry around with us. Anyway, um, Despite the fact that he wrote many of these in the 1940s and maybe even earlier, they are still so relevant. He gets at issues of racism and um, the way people treat each other and classism. and But all of this is done through these entertaining stories. Many of them take place either in rockets or on other planets. Bradbury's a big fan of, you know, people exploring Mars and Venus and other planets. Um, I just, I loved every story in here. Um, really enjoyed the collection as a whole. And I highly recommend it. That's The Illustrated Man by Ray Bradbury. So that was my reading month in January. I'd love to hear what you read last month. Let me know in the comments down below what some of your favorite books were from last month. I'd love to hear about it.